stuff to talk about, but hopefully it won't take but uh, 50 minutes or so. Um, we're going to talk about uh, chapter 17. The beginning of it talks about something called emancipation. It's a fancy word. It has a very small meaning, but it has a big impact on uh, the outcome of the war. So chapter 17 is mostly going to talk about how we're going to end the war. So the beginning of chapter 17, things aren't looking great. In fact, if we characterize chapter 16 based on who do you think is winning, Overall, probably about half of you would say the Confederacy is winning up to that point because they're winning battles and, and they've got hesitators on the Union side. They can't seem to get anything done, with the exception of Ulysses Grant that is doing well out west and, and David Perry. So <coughs> we're having some issues, uh, but we have a big victory in September uh, of 1862. Does anybody remember what big victory it was? It's the one where George McClellan had the Confederates sort of wobbling, like in Wee Boxing, the bloodiest single day of fighting in American history. You think it's gonna, yeah, the Battle of Antietam. It's a, it's a Union victory. It's not, it could have been a crushing Union victory. Like they could have chased the Confederates into the South and maybe destroyed the Army of Northern Virginia without any more war being necessary, but instead the war is gonna last another two years. So McClellan is going to be replaced because of that. But Lincoln had been waiting for a victory, and, and Antietam becomes the victory that was necessary for him. Uh, and then we'll see, does that Emancipation Proclamation actually change the purpose or the cause of the war? On the short answer test that is, uh, was due yesterday, um, what I was really looking for was the border states question. What I was really looking for was the fact, there were two things that I really would give full credit for. The fact that uh, if those border states would have seceded, the capital of the Union would have been in the Confederacy, which obviously was a problem. Some people put that. What I really wanted you to tell me was that if those border states are slave states that remain in the Union, this can't be a war that's just about slavery which is most people's perception. So most people, if you ask a common person what's the Civil War about, their answer is probably slavery. And they're not wrong, they're just not the rightest. If you go home and ask your parentals what's the Civil War about, that's probably going to be their answer. It doesn't mean they're idiots, it's just that they don't know all of the details. And that's fair because it's been probably 20 some years since they've been in a history class and even then, the history class followed the textbook, they're probably not talking about the same thing that they're talking about. And up until probably the last few years, that's the only type of classes that existed were ones that followed the textbook. You guys are, well, unfortunate enough that you have me and your wife to talk about lots of other things. So uh, that's the goal today. And again, check it to, to make sure you're not missing any stuff. If you have outstanding grades, if it says zero or there's no grade next to you, have three grades right now. One is a study guide partial completion grade, one is your essay test grade, which I think is 15 points, and one is the test that you did for me on uh, Tuesday, and that was the 27 point. So that's the what you should have. If you're missing any of that, uh, go back and, and make sure you come and talk to me during when. If you're watching this as a video, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, I cough into the microphone. If you're watching this as a video, come and see me as soon as you can. I'll be gone this afternoon, Thursday afternoon, but I'll be back next week. So uh, this is chapter 17. There is a new set of fill-in notes for you. Uh, I think I'm just putting them this morning, and honestly, I didn't have a chance to take a look at them and see if they were what I wanted. But I did get an extra half hour sleep, which is pretty rare. So I'm going to. That's why I'm able to.
watch this video, for those of you that are watching this video on video, uh, the link is live in your fill-in notes to watch this, but this is a, an old school show called the, the Andy Griffith Show. Uh, probably if I asked you to raise your hand, half of you would raise your hand and say you've seen at least an episode of this. But the guy in the left-hand side of your screen, this is Andy, he's the sheriff. He knows everything. He's a smart, grounded guy. He's the sheriff of a tiny town, a little country town called Mayberry. I believe that it's set in North Carolina. I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, but it's small. It's the kind of town where everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everything about everybody. It's kind of like the place where I grew up. There's a lot of benefits to growing up in a small town where you know everybody. You know who you can trust and who you can't. In a town where you know everybody, you don't have to take the keys out of your car. Even when you're parked downtown, you don't have to lock your doors, which was kind of fun too. Because if your buddy was eating at uh, lunch at the diner, you could just leave their car halfway around the block and they'd still know you and still take care of you. But they'd also know who did it because they know you're in town because it's a small town, so then they get even later. So you got to understand what comes around goes around. The, the negative of a small town is uh, everybody knows everything. If everyone knows who you are, then your mother has approximately, uh, my town had 456 people in it, that was the popular. Uh, my mother had approximately 456 spies. So she knew what I did before I could tell her what I did. Couldn't get away with anything. Whereas in a town the size of Blair, you can tell the newspaper about your parents spying on your mom. It depends on how good their spy network is. How many of you have uh, moms or dads that have a really good spy network? everything out in the town. And sometimes it's because you have them and not their fault and they're dragging you out. And sometimes it's just because they have a lot of fun at it. You can't get away with it. It's just what you go with. Uh, now Barney, the guy on the right hand side, he thinks he knows everyone. And, and he's going to be asked to explain what is the Emancipation Proclamation. And so those of you that are watching this on video, uh, if you would, pause my video go into this video, press play, it's two and a half minutes long, um, but it's just a portion of an episode of the Andy Griffith Show, which we see a frustrated man, and while you're doing that, I think, think about the people that you know, probably even some teachers that you've asked questions before, they have no idea what the answer is, but they try to fake it. Some people are really good at faking it, and some people like Barney are here because you're on the right hand side, are not, and then you also might notice there are two other characters. One is an old lady named Aunt B. Uh, looks like an old version of Grace. Grace is an old lady. It, she's not laughing. Anyway, she takes care of Andy. Andy's, uh, I think his wife died or something. So he's a, a single father and, and they live with Andy and Andy takes care of Grace. Uh, and then Andy has a son, a little boy named Opie. And you'll probably notice that Opie looks almost exactly like Dwight and Reese. Not long, just one and two. But you have to take a few years off to watch it. Why is he angry about this? Because he doesn't think that it's true. But everyone always seems to enjoy it when Wyatt does that, and so it's okay. Yeah. I'm right. Equal opportunity hit or run. And some of you guys know this, but I'm a total idiot. So I pick on everybody. has been equally opportunity hit or run. And I almost never pick on Kate. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because she usually gets picked on by all of us. So here's the thing. Lincoln was waiting for a big victory and he gets that victory at the Battle of Antietam, even though it wasn't as big of a victory as he wanted, but he'd been uh, people have been in his ear up to this point saying, Come on, Mr. Lincoln, we gotta do something to change the cause or the purpose of this war. It can no longer be just about trying to bring the, the Union back together, to bring the Confederacy back into the Union. This, there, there needs to be a cause. People are losing interest, especially when we're seeing uh, soldiers dying right and left for battles that nobody really cares. If you live in New York and you're a street sweeper, do you really care if South Carolina is part of the United States? 
that's the issue that we're running into. People are becoming complacent, and they don't want to send their sons or their husbands or their boyfriends or their fathers off to fight in a war that doesn't matter to them. So they're like, Lincoln, you've got to give it a cost. But he can't give it a cost because he's getting his rear end kicked. And if he shifts the purpose of the war, it's going to look like he's desperate for change, which he really kind of is. But if he waits for a victory, it looks less like desperateness and more like, hey, we're going to do the right thing here. So he's going to change this from a war about bringing the union back together to a war to free the slaves. The word emancipate means to set free. So when you're 18, and you become, is it 18 or 19? I'm going to push you a little bit. I think it's 18. 19 in Nebraska. When you're 19, you're emancipated. You're, you're free. Your parents can still tell you what to do because they're probably still paying your cell phone bill and helping you with college. But if not, if you're out on your own, living in your own apartment with your own job, nobody can tell you what to do as long as you follow the law. That's emancipation. You're, you're free. As it is now when you're 14, you are kind of doing what to do what your parents tell you to do because they pay all your bills and they feed you and they clothe you and they take you where you need to go. You don't have too many options. So hopefully you have good parents that, uh, well, hopefully your parents are a little bit evil. Anyway, so let's free the slaves, thinking that this would weaken the South. If we make this a war about freeing the slaves, uh, some of those four to six million uh, African Americans living in the South under slavery, what might they be likely to do? Maybe join the Union in order to do that. What do they have to do? They got to escape. They got to rebel. They got to overthrow their masters. If this war is now about them, shifted it, then there's more interest on their part. But we also have some problems that come along with that. Um, what do you think the biggest problem that Lincoln faces if he makes this a war to free the slaves? It was a question that was on your test, your essay test, but it didn't have anything to do with freeing the slaves. What's the biggest, the, the monster in the closet that Abraham Lincoln's going to have to deal with? Yes, Kate says the border states. If this is now a war about freeing the slaves, what are those five border states going to do? They're going to run off and join the Confederates. They're going to secede also. Can Lincoln afford to lose those border states? Absolutely not. Let's see. Um, Jaden, give me one of the five border states. There's no North Virginia. Oh, no, it's West Virginia. Well, thank you, West Virginia. I was getting a lot known this morning. Uh, Kelson, tell me another of the five border states. Very good. Delaware. Taylor. Boy, Taylor, give me another one of the border states. That's not a state. Uh, Missouri. So what do we got so far? We got West Virginia, Delaware, Missouri. Adam. North Carolina, no, not North Carolina. Kate, Maryland. Maryland. So, so far we've got West Virginia, I forgot already, uh, Delaware, uh, Missouri, North Virginia, and what'd you say? Maryland. Maryland. So, we're missing one. Somebody give me the fifth one. What do you say? Kentucky. We're going to lose all those. So, Lincoln puts a clause into his Emancipation Proclamation that only slaves in Confederate territories would be set. So if you're a border state, what does that mean? You get to keep your slaves. So that makes this a little wishy-washy. Is this a war about freeing the slaves? Yes, but no. Those border states got to be a little bit nervous, but the majority of the people in those border states don't own slaves anyway. It's not like they're all slaves. Even in the deep south, and the, the slaviest of the slave states, only a third. We get into uh, North Virginia. 
Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and it looks like Northern California. When we get into those, now, yeah, there's not that many slaveholders in any state. Uh, not any other states, just states rebelling against the union. So that's a big deal. Uh, did it actually free the slaves? No. Why? So if Abraham Lincoln stands up and says, all of the slaves in states rebelling against the union shall be set free, thenceforth and forevermore. Why doesn't South Carolina just say, well, gag nabbit, and set all of their slaves free? Can't afford to, they still need them. Gotta give them their freedom, and why aren't they willing to give them their freedom? Fifth Amendment of the Constitution says that I have the right to own property. It can't be taken away just because. You're missing the most obvious answer. Well, that's true. Why don't they have to follow? This is a new law or a new rule. Why don't they have to follow it? Who's their president? I don't remember. But is it Abraham Lincoln? Oh, that'd be like the president of Canada, the prime minister of Canada. I think his name is Justin Trudeau. Telling Americans, uh, you're no longer allowed to chew gum. What? I like chewing gum. Oh, dang it, I guess I have to stop chewing. Why don't I have to listen to the prime minister of Canada? He's not my leader. If the United States Congress passed the law and President Biden signed it, making chewing gum illegal, then we got a battle on our hands. Because legally, I gotta follow that law, but I don't have to follow the law of a country that's not my country. There's a lot of countries that have really silly, really bad laws. I was just listening to the news the other night, <coughs> and they said uh, uh, they listed two countries in the Caribbean where it's illegal to be homosexual. And I thought, well, that's a funny law. Well, not funny, but it's a weird law. We think that we have oppression in America. don't have to follow their rules and their laws because they're not our country. Twenty-six countries outlaw homosexuality, is that what you're saying? It really doesn't surprise me. There's 200 countries, so I'm really kind of surprised there's not more than that. But uh, anyway, we're, we're not debating whether or not it's okay their opinions on that, but those aren't strictly your opinions, but we don't have to follow those laws, and America is not against the law. So, it, a lot of weird things out there, but if, if Abraham Lincoln's not my president, I'm not going to do what he says. Uh, so, no, it doesn't free any slaves, besides the fact that Abraham Lincoln is not the president. The president is Jefferson Davis, so we can better spell it. Besides the fact that Lincoln isn't their president, in order for anybody to actually free those slaves, what is the northern army going to have to do to get them free? Go into the south, win battles in areas of the south, and set the slaves free in those areas. At least up to this point, has the Union had a lot of success in going into the south and winning battles? Not very much at all. So, yeah, no, not really going to happen. So now we're going to fight the war to liberate men. So what this really does is it gives a shot in the arm to abolitionists. If you are an ardent abolitionist, if you are a strict believer that slavery is horrible and rotten and owning humans is um, immoral and wrong, do you have any choice but to join the fight against it? Not now, you don't. If you're a, an ardent gum chewer and you always have a piece of gum in your mouth, this law is going to bother you. This no chewing gum law is going to bother you a lot more than it bothers people that don't chew gum at all, right? You're, excuse me. You're going to be willing or it's going to become necessary for you to argue against this law. You've got to fight back, which means you elect different people and send them to Congress to get rid of their stupidity. Chewing gum is okay. Sticking gum in somebody's hair is not okay. You stick it in my hair. not going to hurt my hair. You can't stick it in Candace Owens' hair. Just for fun. 
You can speak English if you want to. You'll get the really sticky stuff, like the big league chew. That's really sticky. They want to preserve, not destroy the Union, and uh, no slaves is going to destroy the Southern economy. If we destroy the Southern economy, can they afford to fight? So lots of things going on. Uh, we're doing kind of similar stuff that with uh, Russia right now. We're not telling them they can't have slaves, they don't have slaves. But we're in attempting to hurt their economy to the point where if they have no money, they can't fight war. Wars are extremely expensive. If uh, Russia's main supply of income is oil, everybody refuses to buy their oil, we boycott Russian oil, then all of a sudden there's no income for Russia, they can't buy it anymore. If I lose my job, I can't afford to put gas in my car, I can't go out and get another job. So if you really want to make it really difficult for me to survive, there are ways to do that. So this is a quote, this is Abraham Lincoln, part of his by the way, he issues this Emancipation Proclamation right after the Battle of Antietam. So it's like, a, well, it's like October, November of 1862. But he said, on the, by the way, look at the way he writes compared to the way we talk or the way we write. Remember, this guy has almost no education. But on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863. All right, if you and I were writing this, this, just this first three lines right here. On the first day of January, the year of our Lord, 1008, what would we say, all of us? Yeah, on January 1st, 1863. We would have shortened it up, but would it sound near as cool? No, Abraham Lincoln has a really good little word. All persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall then, henceforth and forever, be free. Simplify it. We already got on January 1st, 1863. What's the rest? Not all slaves, but slaves in states rebelling against the Union are free. Again, does he have the power to do that? No, he's going to have to exert the power to do that, but it sounds really good. Sounds like, woo, yeah, this guy's really making things happen. But I love the way Abraham Lincoln writes and the way he speaks. It's very, very formal compared to us, but yet understandable at the same time. Sometimes when you read stuff from 150 years ago, it doesn't make any sense because the vocabulary is different. But I think all of us could read the Emancipation Proclamation and make sense of it. So as of January 1st, 1863, all slaves in states rebelling against the Union are free, which means the border states who are not rebelling against the Union get to keep their slaves. So there's a lot going on in the mind of Abraham Lincoln. What are the problems? Well, he actually doesn't have the constitutional power to free the slaves. The Fifth Amendment, according to Roger Taney, the Dred Scott decision that we talked about several chapters ago, the Fifth Amendment protects your rights to property. And if slaves are defined as property, we haven't changed that definition yet, can't take away somebody's property. There are very few instances when somebody can take away your property. Like I own 10.6 acres of land in the middle of nowhere. It's trees, and grass, and beehives, and my house, and the shop. The government can't just come and say, Mr. Gomer, we're going to take that away from you. That's called uh, uh, the Fifth Amendment protects my right to own that. But there are some instances when the government can, and, it, and that's very rare. It's called eminent domain. This happened, actually, when, uh, and you guys probably don't remember it because you either would have been non-existent or really small. When we changed Highway 133, so the main highway between Omaha and Blair, to four lanes, they needed to widen it a lot. Because it was just two lanes, and it was a really dangerous highway to drive on because some people are going 80 and some people are going 40, and it's really difficult. Uh, to, to, there's a lot of traffic. So the government had to exercise what was called eminent domain and 
take that land from the landowners that owned it at least wide enough to expand the highway. It's really difficult to do. And if I'm a, a landowner, I can sue the state because I don't want to give up my land, but ultimately the state will win. Do they just take it for free? No, they have to pay a fair market value. So I don't have any choice, but they're going to pay me for it. I might not want to sell them my land, but they can take it because it's for the good of all of us. And it makes some people mad. For the most part, as I remember as it was going through, there weren't a whole lot of issues with it. I suppose all the farmers that had to sell land in the state farm were happy about it. But there was a sad story that went with that. There was an old couple, I think they were in their 70s or their 80s, that were living in a little teeny tiny farmhouse that doesn't still exist. Um, it had to be burned down or destroyed. So they forced this little old couple to sell their little piece of land so they could move into the next farm. And people were sad and upset about that. Because they were just little old people and they wanted to live the rest of their life in their house and instead they always had to have their piece of land. So not everyone is always happy with it. You have to have the constitutional authority to just take it away. The chances of the government ever needing my land for a purpose like that are very slim because I live in the middle of nowhere. If you live right alongside a two-lane highway or if you live in, in Blair and we need to build a big overpass over the top of the railroad tracks, Many in the union didn't want emancipation. But here's the thing. If we set all the slaves free in the southern states, when the war is over and we're back to buying cotton and tobacco from the southern states, what happens to the price of cotton and tobacco if there aren't slaves growing? It goes up. If we're going to put sanctions on Russia, if we're going to make a, we're no longer going to buy Russian oil. We take all of Russia's oil out of the picture. They're the third, I think, the third largest producer of oil in the world. If we stop buying Russian oil uh, and the, the pool of what is available shrinks, what happens to gas prices? They go up. So by us punishing Russia, we're also punishing ourselves. So we have to be willing to do that. Now, is paying more for a gallon of gas? better than sending soldiers in to fight a war? Probably not. But do we send soldiers to fight even if we're really good with giving them money? And we don't want to do that. So we have to make those decisions, and that's kind of what's going on here. I don't want to pay higher gas prices, but maybe I'm willing to if that means that we squeeze Russia and get them to stop fighting this war for us. I should stop using this as an example, because if I play this video, We wanted to keep the border states happy, and, and many thought it might even lengthen the war if it, if it were shortened. So his dilemma, if he could, remember he's about saving the union, he freed all the slaves. Uh, or he'd keep slavery, the promise he made in 1860 when he was elected. I won't do anything as long as you stay loyal to me. Or he free some and not others, or he'd do whatever he had to do. Abraham Lincoln is in a really tough spot decision making. It's about America. It's not about the North or the South. It's about the people. Now, here's another short video, and as soon as I turn off uh, our recording for today, we'll watch this clip because I think it's a lot of good about the top. About Lincoln and his decision to end the Spanish Constitution. So, uh, we'll shut down here shortly and then come back to this video. So, those of you who are watching this on the live stream, you can go into your polling box. So what do we end up seeing here? African Americans in the North going in large numbers. It takes a while to get the Union convinced to let blacks fight. And there's lots of reasons why. Blacks were considered inferior. What is the word inferior? They're no good. They don't have any power. They're not equal to a white person. That was a common, normal thought. Even abolitionists had a hard time believing that a black man was equal to a white man. After all, they're all dumb. The reality of it is, is it that they are dumb, or is it that they're never given an opportunity to learn? We don't put black people in school. So 
So of course they seemed ignorant because they didn't know stuff that everyone else knew. Many of them could have been smart, but a higher percentage of them were blessed in life and didn't have those opportunities. So they seem like they don't belong. But in reality, if we allow them in, and 180,000 blacks are going to join the Union Army by the end of the war, uh, who has the most to fight? We watch a movie about that eventually with an all black regiment. Um, and usually black regiments had white officers because they didn't trust black civilians. And, so. and uh, the South was pretty tough on blacks that were captured as soldiers. Uh, they'd be taken into slavery. And white officers that are in charge of black soldiers will be executed. So if you're a white officer in charge of a black regiment, you immediately have to leave. Because if you're captured, there's no And they were given a little or, or less or no pay. Now, eventually, probably in the next week or so, we're going to watch a movie called uh, Glory. Glory is about this group of men. They're called the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. It's an all-black regiment with white officers. And in the movie Glory, it, it tells us what is basically, for the most part, a true story of the 54th and the struggles that they go through to get what is sort of equality in, in the Army how hard it is for them to gain the respects of the white men that they're fighting alongside. Nobody trusts them in the beginning. By the end, the 54th Massachusetts has demonstrated that they are as good, maybe even better, than a lot of the white men. But it's an uphill battle. It's not an easy thing. And this is, a, this is the movie that we'll watch. Uh, you will recognize some of the people. They're younger because this is probably from the time they were in the Civil War. Well, 1989, so it's old. But you're going to like it. Matthew Broderick, you've probably seen him before if you've ever seen uh, How Samuel Lloyd Spoke School. Um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, that's Ferris Bueller. Uh, Denzel Washington, everybody likes Denzel Washington. Major hit. And, and Morgan Freeman, everybody likes Morgan Freeman. So this movie is chock a block full of really good actors. Uh, but this is what's kind of interesting to me is they did a really good job of glory. This is the, the colonel that plays the character Robert Gould Shaw. That's a real photograph of Robert Gould Shaw. It was an action contest. It's sort of like if we reenacted um, Andy Griffith's show. We need a trophy. We need you to play the role of Rosie. You won't do that one time. You play the detective. You won't this time, Rosie. Uh, and this is a, a letter from. I think that's probably, that's pro how much time do we have? Do you know? 20 minutes? Oh, okay, let's do this and then we'll be done. Okay. <coughs> I try to hurry, but I don't need to hurry too much. Let's see. This is a recruitment poster. This is propaganda. Propaganda, remember, is information designed to help or harm a cause. So this poster's goal is to get black soldiers to join the Union Army. The most uh, effective, probably the most famous propaganda poster used for recruitment. Does anybody know what it is today? Not Civil War, but today. Yeah, Uncle Sam pointing his finger, right? And I should have got it out for class, but Uncle Sam pointing his finger and he says, I want you for the U.S. Army, or I want you for the U.S. Navy. They changed it up. Why is it so effective? Because the artist that created it appeals to several different senses. Uncle Sam is a little old man. Okay, if you got a little old man grandpa, and little old man grandpa asks you to do something, as simple as it might be, if you're at grandpa's house and little old man grandpa says, um, Adam, would you please take out the garbage? You don't argue, you just do it because you respect your elders, right? More so than your parents. If your parents say, Adam, will you please take out the garbage? Uh, later when I'm done playing this game. That's a common response, at least in my house. And then sometimes it never happens, and I end up doing it myself. But if Grandpa says do it, it gets done. So we, we have this greater amount of respect for our elders. That Uncle Sam poster works because Uncle Sam, he's all of our uncles. He's a little old man, so of course we're going to do it. 
It also works because it has a point to his finger. Whatever artist created that thing, it's really creepy but effective. If I'm Uncle Sam and I'm pointing, it would appear that I'm pointing directly at Kenna right now. But in the poster, it also would appear that I'm pointing at Silas clear across the room. And it would appear that I'm staring at Silas. So somehow, the guy that the artist that created that poster made it so that it individualizes all of us. It's not I need you, it's I need you. Okay, so there's a purpose why that poster is effective. What makes this effective in getting blacks to join the union on? The black men on the poster. You want to be part of the group. Not only are there black men on the poster, but tell me about these black men. <clears throat> free. Most northerners' blacks were free anyway, but absolutely they're free. Yeah, they're, they got a white officer, which means that they got someone they could trust as a white man. That doesn't exist even everywhere. Most of them got your officer. What about the flag? Do you suppose black people in the north were patriotic? Almost all propaganda posters that are used for recruiting have the flag in because all of us love America. How about the fact that they're black men and they're holding rifles? That means that the army's going to trust me with the gun? Nobody trusts me. Even in the north, blacks are not equals. But in this picture, do they appear? If you join the army, you're given an opportunity to be the same as a white soldier. Well, do you, do you suppose most black people, even in the north, had clothing that night? Also, we had to pay more on the food. Of course, who wouldn't fight for a child? All of us. We fight to protect them. You see some big guy beating up a little kid. a lot of things in this recruiting poster that are encouraging African Americans to convince them that they should join. And a, a boost of 180,000 people. And remember, as this war drags on, it's getting harder and harder to find white soldiers. The Confederacy especially. So as we got an extra 180,000 men joining the Union Army, the Confederacy is struggling to replace them in their own. We're getting closer and closer. So this is a big shot in the arm. It ends up making a big difference for President Lincoln, and it will lead us into Washington. Which I bet you I've seen Glory 40 times, and I still like it. I showed it to uh, classes for probably 17 years, and I don't think I've ever had a student that said that was a bad movie. I don't think I've ever encountered that. Because nobody likes it, even though it's 19. We'll schedule that in. I'm not sure we can do this one. Okay. So our, our goal today was to talk about the Emancipation Proclamation, the problems and the resolutions with issuing such a proclamation. We looked at the flowery speech of Abraham Lincoln. We watched uh, Barney Fife try to explain away the Emancipation Proclamation by giving a description of it uh, unsuccessfully. And we've moved into recruiting black men. I'm going to exit out, and then I'm going to go back in, and we're going to watch that uh, video clip that we skipped so I don't get put in YouTube jail, and then, then uh, we'll be done for today. I'll get the short video clip for you tomorrow. Uh, give me just a second. Uh, those of you watching, sorry, watching on uh, YouTube, uh, you can work on your study guide. There is a Chapter 17 study guide in uh, Google Classroom. There's not a lot you can put on it, but I'm going to bet you Emancipation or Emancipate is on there. So you can go ahead and get started with that uh, right away. Uh, and make sure you have a wonderful weekend.